<clears throat> Hello, um, today is uh, uh, the 7th of uh, January 2023, and we'll talk about two topics, but both related to the 7th of uh, January. First, Winnie Mas was born on this day, uh, but not this year, of course, and then we'll talk about uh, building for St. John, because in, uh, in, uh, for the Orthodox uh, religion, today is uh, St. John's Day but it is not for uh, other parts of Christianity. But for us, it is St. John's Day, and I will show, I will show architecture built for, uh, uh, for St. John. Uh, let me begin with Winnie Mass, though. Uh, just a second. Okay, so Wilhelmus Winnie, Winnie Mass, born in 1959, in uh, in the in uh, in uh, the Netherlands is a Dutch architect, landscape architect, professor, and urbanist. In 1993, together with Jacob van Ries and Nathalie de Vries, nu știu dacă e pronunț bine numele, ar fi trebuit să caut, he set up MVRDV, uh, a very well-known name in architecture today. Well, here it is written that he is a Dutch architect, but from, from what I read, he was initially trained as a landscape architect. And this, I think, is important that um, uh, not only that, his family worked in the field of, uh, um, I don't know, uh, flowers, uh, plants. So there was a connection with nature. Uh, at a deep level, uh, both in terms of his education and in terms of his um, own biography. Wilhelmus Winnie. Uh, he completed his study at uh, this, uh, I don't know how to translate those initials, uh, Boskup graduating as a landscape architect, as I said. And in 1990, he got his degree from the Delft University of Technology. He currently is visiting professor of architectural design at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and is professor in architecture and urban design at the Faculty of Architecture, Delft University of Technology. Before this, he was professor, among others, Berlache Institute and Ohio State, um, an important school in Ohio and Yale uh, University. So uh, I took his uh, birthday date from a site. Um, you, you see here uh, uh, on the left, the le left corner, Winnie Mass, January 7th, with birthdays of important architects. Um, okay, moving forward. This is the man <laughs> without the head, but the head will follow. I like his shirt, you know, he's uh, modest and um, unassuming. But his face shows uh, an interesting man, I, I would say. Now, I, I, I don't know for sure if his hair is so romantically curled. Maybe it is. Uh, under tomorrow's sky, Winnie Mas, architect. Interesting, uh, interesting uh, title here or naming, Under Tomorrow's Sky. This reminds me of... Uh, once I, 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 I said a few words at Columbia University in New York, where I said that we, we forgot to live under the sky. And this man, I, or somebody wrote, I don't know if it was his idea for this title, Under Tomorrow's Sky. Um, anyway, I like him, you know, he's uh, inquisitive and uh, he's, uh, you know, one of these Dutch people who are restless and experimental and uh, forward-looking, and they are great both in art and architecture and in other fields as well, probably. Why is it that the Dutch are so and other countries are not? MVRDV, the, the company that uh, he, he was a founder uh, of, he, he was a founding uh, member, uh, he said, I think, we pursue a fascination for radical, investigative spatial research focusing on the urban landscape, the public realm. The first word, radical. And I will ask the students here, are you radical? And if you are not, why, why aren't you? 
I think we need more people to be radical. Yes, because we need we need experiments. We need the new. We need inventions. We need to, to escape boredom and apathy. Look at the three founders. They're all nice, if you ask me. You know, open-minded, young in spirit. That's what we look at here. Not bureaucrats or uh, you know. Um, financiers, you know, although they have so much success now that they are doing well in that field as well. But again, I think it is very important to contemplate such pictures because we realize that when, when, when an artist, when an architect who assumes courageously creativity achieves doing that, very often uh, success even at a mundane level uh, uh, arrives. And those who are timid and mellow and afraid will never arrive there, not even in terms of material success. So again, I think it pays to be true to yourself, to be very creative and yes, sometimes at least radical. I like them. Bravo to them. It doesn't mean uh, that life is difficult for all of us, but but you know, she smiles, she has a, you know, a, a nice expression and uh, Winnie also, you know. And of course, they are very realized, they are, they are very accomplished, no? Because they do very creative works. You might agree with them, you might agree less with them, but you have to acknowledge that they do very creative works. Although, paradoxically, Winnie Mas declared recently, and I read, uh, I read this, <clears throat> that uh, apparently he's not against architects uh, copying or uh, inspiring themselves from other architects, from works from the past and so on. He even used the word to, to copy, which is, um, you know, from a certain perspective, one could uh, question, but uh, it depends. He is certainly not a man who, who copies other people's works because their work, is very original, very often. Here they are as younger people. I think it pays to be adventurous. And even in love, I read that actually the goddess of love um, uh, has uh, sympathy, has um, affection for those who take risks, for those who are bold. So I would say, to students in architecture and to architects alike, be bold, be bold, be true to yourself. Don't be timid. Uh, you, you might even need to be excessive. As Oscar Wilde said, you know, moderation is a fatal thing. Only excess succeeds. I don't know. I'm, I wouldn't be so drastic, but Maybe there is some truth there. Moderation is a fatal thing. Now, what is moderation? Being halfway, doing nothing, you know, all, all the way, so to speak. And, and, and that is punished by the gods of fate, I think. Now, this is their office, but here I see only ladies. I'm sure they have men too. Or maybe it's not even their office. I mean, I searched for their office on Google Images, but, uh, you know, maybe this is just half of their office, because it's hard for me to believe that, you know, no man is present. But if these, these uh, you know, young ladies are working in the office of MVRDV, bravo to them. They seem to be happy. And they do joyous work. Why shouldn't they be happy? Now, I like to show pictures sometimes, you know, beginning from the bottom, moving upwards. And I don't know if you recognize who is who here, looking just at the, at the, at the, at the shoes. Uh, now, of course, the, the, the founding members are in the, in the foreground, and you recognize the lady, and uh, of course, Winnie Mas is on the right, and, uh, and so on, you know. Uh, you know, I, I envy these people. I am happy for them, but I'm, I also envy them, you know, because again and again, it pays to have courage. It pays, it pays to be avant-garde. It pays to break new ground. It pays to, and it pays not just uh, poetically and metaphorically, 
or in terms of, I don't know, fame or honor. It also pays in, in, the, in the pragmatic sense because they are doing very well at all levels. This is what happens when you do significant work. And if you don't do significant work, well, drawings, some drawings by Winnie Mas. Now, of course, MVRDV is not just him, but apparently he's the chief designer or, and he, he probably is. Um, although I'm sure the others also have a, a word to say in, in, in these matters, but maybe he's, he's the most adventurous. And look at his drawings, you know? I mean, this is the kind of drawing which, you know, would be considered uh, almost nonsense by, uh, you know, those uh, more timid. Is it conceptual? In a way it is. It is temperamental? Yes, it is te temperamental too. It is abstract? Yes, but it's also figurative. It, it's, 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 it is labyrinthical? Yes, it's labyrinthical. It, it's about his mind. And, um, and, 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 and it's not just the drawing. We'll, we look at the works and we'll see some of these, uh, uh, some of these qualities in the built work. Balancing barn in, in England, it's a, it's a house. Uh, and let's read a little bit about it. Balancing barn is situated on a beautiful site by a small lake in the English countryside near Thornington in Suffolk. The barn responds through its architecture and engineering to the site condition and natural setting. The traditional barn shape and the reflective metal sheathing, sheathing take the references from the local building vernacular. In this sense, the balancing barn aims to live up to its educational goal in re-evaluating the countryside and making modern architecture accessible. Additionally, it is both a restful and exciting holy, holiday home, furnished to a high standard of comfort and elegance, set in a quintessentially English landscape it engages, it engages its temporary inhabitants in an um, experience. You probably know it was published um, copiously. Uh, I, I find it a little bit perverse, but uh, it, it is provocative. You know, this cantilevered uh, house, you know, dramatically emerging from the, from the hill and then uh, having the, you know, the, <laughs> The mobile, uh, you know, a playful uh, object here on which someone can sit and uh, swing, uh, you know, exactly here where, where in a way danger imagined or real is at its most intense. Um, otherwise, you know, it is uh, provocative uh, mainly through its materials but particularly towards the exterior and because of the big cantilever part. The interior, yes, is comfortable, it's joyous, it's colorful, it has wood, uh, it has everything. But the outside is, um, you know, because of this uh, metal that, uh, that, uh, that, that covers the, the building, that it's a little bit unexpected. Otherwise, the silhouette of the building, if you make abstraction of the cantilever part, it's, it's not astonishingly new at all. Uh, they are not the only ones who covered houses or a house with metal sheets like here. Um, Thomas Heatherwick did it uh, too for uh, an artist colony. But there is a contrast now between the outside uh, covered in metal and the inside where we see the presence of wood rather, you know, convincingly. This is an early work by MVRDV. But already in this early work, you can see the provocation. You can see that they like to provoke you know, that they are architects provocateurs. And this is the plan. It's straightforward, functional, it works. It's not the smallest house in the world, no, but it's not the biggest either. 
what is big here is the you know the provocation towards uh, gravity because of the big cantilever i hope i have a section here a vertical section yes like here you see clearly that uh, you know the building tries to define defy uh, gravity and uh, it pro probably pushes almost at the limit although Sir Richard Rogers went further than they did in his last work before he died. But that is an art gallery, not a, not a house. An interesting work. And again, if you are not doing interesting works, then, then you, you condemn yourself to, you know, uh, becoming or remaining unknown. And uh, we know the price of that. You know, no commissions arrive, you know, in order to uh, have commissions arrive to you, you have to stand out, you know, to, to, to remark yourself in a certain way, to, to, to say something that other people didn't, didn't uh, and, and that's not so easy. But paradoxically, again, Winnie Moss himself said, why should architects all the time do something new? But he, but he was and is a man who continuously searching for the new and sometimes with outrageous ideas. Now another villa, but no, not another villa. This is not a house. It's a, it's a public building of of some dimensions. Um, I don't know how they got these large commissions, but they did. And you see here also. Although towards the outside, uh, the building is not uh, really labyrinthical at all, but inside the, the agitation of spaces and uh, all kinds of uh, entanglements uh, could make you think of, um, of, of the labyrinth in a way. And uh, this vortex of uh, uh, things, you know, the stomach of the building uh, could... Uh, could create that, some disorientation, but maybe that's what they intended to do, to create just that, because uh, chaos sometimes is good for, for creativity, some people think. Maybe some influences here from Rem Kolhas a little bit. Um, So as we can see in other works by MVRDV, they welcome also disorder. It's not just order, it's also disorder. And, and yes, an interplay between order and disorder is important. Or to put it differently with a different pair of uh, um, you know, uh, entities, necessity and freedom. This is great in, in the Netherlands. They experiment a lot. I consider them, them somehow, you know, the Japanese or the Japan of Europe. They experiment continuously. And I wonder why is it that uh, other countries do much less so? You know, or why is it that we here do not experiment so much? Like, for example, many people... Uh, would uh, comment negatively about what's going on here, you know, in this little corner, you know, how are you going to use this, you know, but as if we have to use everything. But uh, actually you could find, a, a, you know, a, a so-called function for almost any any spot in a, in a building, even if it appears to be, uh, you know, difficult or, uh, uh, you know, implausible or whatever. Because architecture is also capricious, you know, it's in order to arrive at a certain freedom, formal as well, you take some liberties here and there. It's okay. It's okay. Life is the same way. If you don't take some, 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 some risks, where do you arrive? Amsterdam housing. Now look at here, uh, uh, these... Uh, Again, uh, dramatic uh, cantilever part that emerged from that prism. 
hey, they are not very uh, reticent, are they? I mean, I don't know myself if, if I would enjoy very much without having a little bit of anxiety, you know, living here or, you know, using this balcony, you know, knowing that I'm sure it is structurally sound, but it is, uh, it is provocative. But it works. I mean, you know, uh, it was published, it is well known, and um, because of it, they received other commissions, and they became famous, and now they are flooded with works. And I, I, I like the playfulness, you know, the colors, the, you know, the, the aleatory movement of, of the windows, the various sizes of windows. There is playfulness here. And again and again, I say the same thing. You cannot be creative if you are not also playful. You simply have to unite work with play. If you don't play, and just work and work and work and you have no pleasure, no joy, you don't play, I don't think you can create. Even such a serious and the ultimate uh, scientist, Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein apparently said, play is, is um, the, the, the best research is play. Can you believe it? Yes, that's what Einstein said, the best research is playing or play. So please play if you want to be creative. If you don't want to be creative, then discard playing. But uh, you see, MVRDB, they were playing. And uh, playing brought them, uh, you know, joy to begin with, and then, you know, attention from possible uh, future clients, and so on and so forth. It really all depends on your choices in life. If you work in fear and timidity, don't expect, uh, because you have to emanate joy too, uh, because even the passerby loves, loves, you know, new things, provocations for the eye or some other way. Must be nice there in the sun, knowing that you, you have an apartment in, uh, in, in, in this building. Why not? MVRDB. Now, I don't know exactly because, you know, the, the, these works are signed by the company, the firm, MVRDB. But from what I read, he had a major role in most very creative works. And uh, so in good measure, I think he was uh, there, Winnie Mass. The Netherlands Pavilion Expo 2000, Hanover, Germany. Look at this. Again, color, sloping planes, obliqueness, diagonals, the rebels of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, existence in a way, formal or otherwise, the diagonals bring dynamism to, to, to anything. So let's use diagonals. And I invite you to the Diagonal Festival in February, the 26th of February. If you have a work, a project, or whatever, a sketch using oblique, obliqueness, sloping planes, or diagonals, please send it to me and we'll include it in the festival because it will be the centennial of Claude Parent, a very important French architect who all his life tried to promote obliqueness and diagonals and sloping planes. Maybe life itself should be like this. We should escape that uh, obsession with the comfort of uh, horizontality and verticality and, and so on. There are intermediate um, um, entities between the vertical and the horizontal, and that is the diagonal. There are diagonals here. It's a very fine building, really. Bravo to them. And look at these people. I would like the people who are attending this presentation to do buildings in such a way that as many people as here would stay in line in order to enter. 
to enter your buildings, your buildings, not NVRDB's buildings. Now, of course, this is an expo, so, but still, why do you think these people stay in line like this? Because they love the experience. They, they expect a, an unexpected experience inside. That's why. Now, of course, this was before the pandemic, but it will come back. It's good to be open, to open-minded, to have to take risks, to, it's good. It's good, it pays. Plus, it's very possible it was also an ecological statement. We know this, but all in all, the building itself is, 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 is good and is provocative and is uh, engaging and is alive. And look at the section. Wow, it could be a great uh, center of architecture, no? or something, you know. Do you see the playfulness I try to talk about? I do see it. And playfulness provokes joy. And if you work with joy, there is a good chance you enjoy it, of course, and you do creative work. And if you don't work with joy, say goodbye to, to genuine creativity. Now we arrive at another you know, famous work by them, this um, marketplace, this Mark Hall in Rotterdam. Let's read a little bit about it. At a historical location at the Minden Route uh, next to Black Station, the, the railway station in uh, Rotterdam and the largest weekly open air fresh food and hardware market in Rotterdam, the first covered market of the Netherlands was realized. Markt Hall includes a huge market floor on the ground floor under an arch of apartments. Each shape, its colorful interior, again, colorful interior, not white, and the height turns Markt Hall into a unique spectacle. Unique is not only its shape and size, but especially the way the different functions are combined. The combination of an apartment building covering a fresh food market with food shops, restaurants, a supermarket, and an underground parking is found nowhere else in the world. Here it is. Well, you know, it doesn't take great imagination to think immediately of Rubens, the great Dutch painter, because, because what's there on the ceiling, it's exactly that, you know, a Rubens of our time. But then is the, this is the cathedral of fruits and vegetables. This is what it is. It is the cathedral of uh, fruits and vegetables. Why not? What could be more joyous? I wish we had a ceiling in the Cathedral of Mantuiri Niamului also with great fruits and vegetables. After all, maybe Frank Lloyd Wright was correct when he was asked, do you believe in God? And he said, I do, but I spell it nature. So... Maybe the apple, the grapes, the, you know, the salad, the potatoes, whatever that nature makes, maybe God makes them, actually. We say nature made it, but God made it. God made nature. So Frank Lloyd Wright even further, went even further, saying nature is God and God is nature. Of course, the theologians will protest, but somehow... The architect, the Frank Lloyd wrong, was not wrong this time, maybe. But look, look at the architects again. Who did such a market hall in the world before them? As far as I know, no one. They did it. And again, they brought joy into a place where one wouldn't think so much of joy, with the exception of, okay, enjoying salamis and, 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 and cheeses and... Uh, fruits and vegetables, but here you also enjoy the, the fantastic spectacle of, 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 of art, no? of color, of uh, flamboyance. Of, it's a Baroque mentality at work, actually, inside this building. 
Maybe not so much outside with those apartments that cover the, the whole structure, but uh, what is inside, especially this curved uh, ceiling, is certainly Baroque. Don't be afraid of color, please. Please. I mean, would you eat an apple which is white or gray? But why did God make uh, tomatoes red? I didn't make them gray. Would you would you would you eat a gray tomato? Not great, but gray. I don't think so. You would prefer it to be red, no? As you would prefer a, an apple to be red and not gray and not white. Well, there is some grayness here too towards the outside, yes, but the, the contrast is even uh, enhanced now be be between the exterior on the long side of the building and the interior of the big, uh, um, you know, uh, market. A very interesting work. And it's interesting because they welcome back by by dimensional art, like it was uh, like it was done in the past, at a at an urban scale, a huge scale. And look at that uh, uh, strawberry there, <laughs> a delicious strawberry. It's probably you know in, in its dimensions are those of uh, two or three apartments. The biggest stro strawberry ever painted. Nice. Again and again, good architects are poets and artists. And if they are not, then they are not really great architects. I don't think so. They have to bring joy. You have to bring the novelty of invention, of creativity. Otherwise, again, you know, what is our relevance in the world? You know, just to put a brick above another brick without making them at least talk, if not sing, I don't think is enough. Look at this, how many things happen here. Again, because imagination, as Einstein again said, is more important than knowledge. Yes, imagination. Must be a very interesting experience to, to, live, to live here, no? I, I would love it. I unfortunately understood the prices in that market are very high. That's probably the only bad thing about it. Anyway, after the joy of all that, uh, you know, incredible uh, ceiling uh, painted as it is, somehow the architectural plans uh, done in gray lines is a little bit boring, but they exist. Now, again, why is it that the Dutch can do it and we cannot do it? Why? And the, and the funny thing and the paradoxical thing is that they are considered very pragmatic. And in one way, they are. But on the other hand, as you can see, they are very experimental and playful. This is how joy arrives in architecture, through such kind, this kind of works. You know, where you invent something, where you, you, you bring your imagination to the fore. Hello, Mr. Moss, uh, happy birthday to you. He even looks great. So what, why wouldn't he? I'm sure he feels accomplished, no? It's nice to dream and to be able to build your dreams. So build a Tetris-like adaptable and inhabitable installation to envisage future homes. Now look at, at the works of the imagination of these architect and, and his colleagues. <laughs> look at this. You know, something like this is not even uh, accepted in school. 
in maybe many schools of this world, and they built it. Most people will say this is not a house, and in a way it is not, but only in a way, for the imagination is good enough. Look at that, uh, you know, person playing the guitar there. Look at, uh, you know, the, another one uh, enters on the left, uh, you know, taking a stair. Uh, you know, look at that hammock, uh, you know, uh, uh, hanging there from the ceiling. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's an exploration of the unknown of life itself. And people enjoy it. We really forgot how to be happy in architecture. I, I would say this is a, a, a very uh, a pressing and oppressing feeling. You know, while these people invent and reinvent and uh, uh, break new grounds and provoke and... How come here no one is afraid that one might fall, no? I mean, it would be actually very easy. In fact, it would be almost difficult not to fall. But they are not afraid. Because danger is part of life. Let danger, uh, you know, have its place in life. And color too. Some, such a place would make you curious to investigate it just like a child. Now, is this the future of homes? I don't know. But I almost felt tempted, uh, like, uh, like saying, uh, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Now look here, the ceiling, of course, is very low. So you can only sit on something. You cannot stand up. It's OK. You can walk like a to toddler on your knees. You know, or here, you see someone climbing again and again. They are becoming childlike. And this is a good thing, to become childlike. For all of us, doesn't matter the age. And why should a toilet have the ceiling at 2 meters, uh, 30 centimeters, or 40, or 50, or 20? Why can't it have the ceiling like, a, you know, in a small cathedral, if there is such a thing, like here? Or why can't the, you know, look, look where the, the, the um, you know, the washing uh, apparatus is, you know, <laughs> a... It contradicts habit and it contradicts Ernest Neufer, and I think that's fine. The sink, uh, okay, the sink is uh, probably uh, uncomfortable to use. But, but who said that comfort is everything? Discomfort, I mean, these people are probably uh, flirting with discomfort and danger. You see them here, you know? <laughs> And I'm absolutely sure they enjoy themselves doing these uncomfortable things. Giant Stair in Rotterdam, another great work by MVRDV. I love this work. It's done, um, I'm afraid it doesn't exist any longer. But I love this stair, which promotes, you know, difficulty, promotes danger. And I, I, I like the, I mean, effort. And I like the fact that, you know, yes, it was built temporarily. Of course, you could probably bring, uh, so take the elevator from here inside the building and go to the top. But people here stay in line in order to have the chance to climb this long stair here in the center of Rotterdam. And this diagonal, talking about uh, the diagonal festival, and this diagonal, they are clashing, no? They are going in opposite directions. But this is uh, talking about uh, the dynamic qualities. And uh, Rotterdam is considered by some the, the, the city of the future because of its uh, appetite for experiments, for the new, and uh, so on. Uh, this, uh, this building here on the right was not done by him. It's the railway station in uh, Rotterdam, but uh, MVRDV did this there. And I like it very much. 
But unfortunately, it was dismantled, and I regret. Uh, It's not just MVRDB that is open-minded, it's the city itself. I mean, what city in the world would be open to the idea to build such, a, such, a, such an experimental and even temporary uh, stair? I don't think too many, but Rotterdam did it. Do you see the power of architecture? Do you see how, you know, in a way, a simple stair, okay, it's long, okay, it's open, it's an urban stair, but people enjoy it. Although it's probably not so easy to climb it all the way up, but they enjoy it. They enjoy the experience. They, they enjoy the, the, you know, the, the novelty of, of the experience, to see the city from a place where they never were before. Yes, architecture can be very poor, uh, very, very, very powerful if it is engaging. Stimulating people. Individually and collectively. And just like in the case of that building in Hanover, here again, people stay in line in order to have the chance to uh, enjoy themselves with a structure built by MBRDB. And in a, in a certain way, its beauty resides exactly in its uselessness. Because again, if you only wanted to arrive at the top of this building, you could have, you could use uh, one of the, the elevators inside the building. So in a certain way, it is useless. But as John Ruskin said, the most beautiful things in life and in nature are those that are the most useless. In a way, it is useless. But it is beautifully useless, and it is exactly in the freedom that it evokes and makes possible that resides its, uh, its meaning. Because it brings in playfulness, immensely important. And it's not an accident that another Dutch man, Johan Huizinko, wrote the famous book, Homo Ludens, a book you can find in translation in Romania at any second hand bookstore. And it's a good translation. It's a very good book which states that only when playing, the humans create culture. And if you don't create culture, you don't do architecture, actually. Alvaralto said it, and I keep repeating it, architecture belongs to culture, not to civilization. But to create culture, you also have to be a homo ludens, in other words, a playing human being, to play. And NVRDB knows how to play. I'm sure they, they can be and are very serious as well, but they are not morose. Good work. The imprint Seoul. This is a very surrealistic work in Seoul in South Korea. The imprint, a new two building art entertainment complex in close proximity to Seoul's Incheon Airport featuring a nightclub in one building, an indoor theme park in the other, the windowless structures feature three key design elements. 
imprints of the facade features of surrounding buildings, lifted entrances and the golden entrance spot covering one corner of the nightclub building. Here it is. <laughs> I try to imagine making, making such a project for the school. You will be dismissed, totally dismissed and without any discussion. But they built it in Seoul. Bravo to them. Then look at this. Look at this. I mean, look at this corner. Look at this. And you know, the function, functionalist will have a heart attack or will, will tremble nervously, will uh, break a cup or something, you know, will smash the door, will leave the room. What is this nonsense? How could you have this nonsense here? What is this? What are these? The wrinkles of the building? The buildings do not have wrinkles. Winnie Mas, sir. And Winnie Mas smiles and says nothing. <laughs> and they build it in the capital of a very energetic and well-to-do country, South Korea. And look at this building. And what does the functionalist say? The functionalist cannot even breathe when he sees something like this. MVRDV, Winnie Mas. Look at that entrance into the building. I think it's great. It might be a little difficult to do with the T square and the rectangle, but. Now again, the morose functionalists will say, what is this nonsense? You just paint the facade in this way, here gold and here gray, and all these fake windows. Yes, they are fake, but they are sincerely so. They tell you that it's just a stage design towards the outside, but it relates to the function of these complex of buildings which is, uh, which, are, which is about uh, entertainment. And it has to have a psychedelic quality because there is a club, the bars, whatever there is, uh, whatever the functions of, 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 of this uh, structure, structure sees. But I think this, this corner is, is great, you know? Did I ever see something like this before? No, I didn't. Although Trump Lewis and we, we know in Teatro Olimpico or Andrea Palladio, uh, you know, uh, uh, milk, so to speak, the effects of a forced perspective. So playfulness existed always in, in, in art and in architecture. It existed. And uh, some architects were great uh, stage designers. Some of them uh, created designs for... Uh, you know, big uh, parties and festivities of kings and so on. But you see, playfulness, playfulness, but there is also rigor. Imagine the work done in order to have all these pieces with all these fluidities, uh, you know, connect properly. All these lines are perfectly done. This is not easy. They did it. Why? because they are Dutch, flying Dutch, and they are flying. They are even good at soccer. Dressed in, uh, in orange as they are, the orange people. I'm not Dutch, so don't expect that I make, uh, you know, patriotic uh, statements here. But I admire them, you know. I, can, I think we can learn a lot from them, but unfortunately we don't. And look here, you know, uh, there, there are echoes from the, that market in Rotterdam.
if you are a great architect and you are recognized as a great architect, you can get away with murder. You can do anything. Almost nobody will protest. Even if maybe some people might dislike what you do, but because you, you, you have a reputation, you have a name, you know, they, they swallow it, so to speak. No, no, they are unusual architects. Not everything they do, I don't want you to misunderstand me. In, in my opinion, not everything they do is beyond blame, but I admire their continuous experimentation. This is the project. Now a library in China, you probably know it is a famous library inspired by Bule to an extent. Now look at this, how many libraries like this did you see before? Not many. Uh, it's, 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 uh, the, it's the, the, the iconic image of the idea of a library. Well, some of the books, many of the books that are here cannot be accessed. Like how, how are you going to arrive at the books here or here or here or even here? You can't, but the idea is to, to, to make the walls become books. And in a way what happened here, I think consciously or unconsciously, maybe it's a reversal taking place because I keep thinking of Victor Hugo who said that the book after Gutenberg killed the cathedral, because during the Middle Ages, let's say, the, the message, the narrative, the biblical narrative, the biblical story was communicated through the stained glass windows of the cathedral and the walls. But after the arrival of the mass-produced book, after Gutenberg, the story went from the wall of the cathedral into the pages of the book. So Victor Hugo said that the book killed the cathedral. But now the book seems to want to come back to the wall. This is very significant and very interesting. And it might be that the internet unconsciously or unconsciously or unwillingly or willingly is trying to diminish the powers of the book, although the book keeps being uh, fascinating. But, but as you can see in this very example, it wants to become wall. It wants to become the flesh of the wall. I mean, uh, look, there are books even here. No one can arrive here. I don't even know how they how they managed to fill all these shelves with books here. But, you know, I, I think uh, literally books that are accessible are probably less than 10% in all these buildings. But the experience it is, is it's some kind of a ludic cathedral of books. China. China, which was a communist country, wasn't it? And its communism was harsher than in our country, and now is immensely experimental. Why? Because they understood something which we refuse to understand, that only developing technologically very, very, very intensely, they can increase the power of their economy. They work very hard, but you can see they also be, can be playful, and they hire architects like Winnie Mas, and others like him, and to build the outrageous things. And they do. Even useless things, I mean, useless, because again, here there are plenty of books. Will anyone ever arrive here? No, I don't think so. Unless, you know, someone wants to, you know, remove the dust. But these books, you know, are in a way like a, in a cathedral, you know, a, a story that is being told at a an appreciable height, it's there. You might not see it, you might not read it, but it's there. The world is wise, the world knows. And so is in this um, phantasmagoric library, 
which was inspired by the grandiose visions of um, Boulez, the visionary archi French architect of the 18th century. I, re I come back to what Stephen Hall said, remain idealistic. The soul needs the ideal more than the real. And that's what we see here, idealism. Okay, you might see it's bombasticism, you might say it's, uh, it's um, you know, uh, flamboyant in a negative sense. You could say maybe that too, but it's an experience uh, that uh, you cannot easily forget or ignore. The Valley, Amsterdam, a more recent work. Now, again, here the timid functionalist will protest. Why is the building eroded like this? Why is it ruined on one side? Why? But the ruin is part of the process of life. And so, so are the processes of nature. It is the ruin that tells you how things are done, as Louis Kahn said, but it's also the ruin that evokes other powers beyond those of architecture exclusively. Amsterdam, it was built. So what we do most of the time is what you see here on the left, towers pushed, put, pushed to plinth edges. And what they did is here. So let's compare this with this. This one welcomes also the disorder of life. Here it's called uh, rather pedantically the redistributed uh, program. Well, these are strategies to sell their ideas. There is freedom, but there is also rigor. They are great builders. They know what they are doing. Things had to function also and not to allow leaks and so on to damage the life of the people using these, these rather exotic towers. during construction. It was done, it was finalized. I, when I did this presentation, I don't think uh, this particular work was, was finalized, but it is now. It's a hybrid uh, complex of buildings. It has housing and also offices, if I understood correctly. And the truth is today, almost anything can be built. Now again, the simplistic functionalists would protest, would say, why do we need this complication here? And this is a ridiculous question, really. I mean, uh, remove uh, pleasure and adventure from life and you die of boredom. You need, you need something also a little bit of excitement, no? Uh, and this is the role of art that it is music, it is dance, it is uh, progressive architecture. We need, we need uh, intensity and poetry and, and essentially love, passion. And love is irrational. Love, love is not a cube. Love is not a, you know, a clear cut prism. A, a, a love has uh, distortions and conflicts like here. But here we have a duality, we have both sides. You know, we have this, uh, you know, part which is, uh, you know, with uh, uh, all glass, and then we have fragmentation and, uh, you know, uh, distortions and variety and multiplicity. 
it's interesting. It's really about erosion, essentially, because you imagine that these uh, prisms were uh, at first, you know, uh, regular uh, prisms, and then through a certain process, they were eroded, eaten up by some forces. Malicious? Maybe a little bit. Playful? Yes. Some Piranesian spaces, especially if the lights are turned off, I imagine. But imagine the, the surprises that people who, have, who live here and work here have. This is stimulating for, for the imagination of people. And living in such spaces makes you creative too. Art Depot, Rotterdam. I don't know if this was finished. It might have been, but um, in fact, it looks almost finished here, uh, if not uh, without almost. Uh, Art Depot, you know, we, again, they welcome, they welcome reflection, they welcome the irrational into the rational. And uh, I think this is a good thing. An Art Depot. You know, like Dedeman, but you go to the depot not to buy, uh, you know, construction materials, but to buy art. It's a it's a warehouse in a way, but playfully done and uh, with some uh, whimsical, um, you know, uh, ideas here. Uh, we see Mr. Mas uh, the second from the right, and then some other you know, people who participated to this adventure. <laughs> they probably enjoy themselves, although they look a little stern, but um, they are probably exhausted because they do work hard. And now we see the art in the, the art depot, you know, <laughs> because we need art, we need. Some even said, you know, in the Latin times, ars longa vita brevis, art is long, life is short. Although Lebius Woods protested and said, art is short and life is long. Well, they, they need each other, life and art. Sometimes life copies art, if you can believe it. And I remember an unbelievable uh, thing happened to the great, 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 Russian poet Alexander Pushkin. Pushkin wrote Onegin, a play about um, um, someone who, who becomes jealous that his wife was flirting with, uh, I don't know, the French ambassador or so, provokes him to a duel and dies in that duel. So this is what Pushkin wrote. And then two years later, exactly the same thing happens to him. <laughs> And he dies too. Young, being young, the most important poet of, of, a, of, a, of a country with many important poets, Russia, Alexander Pushkin. So art preceded life. Exactly what happened to him, he described two years earlier in Onegin, a play by Alexander Pushkin. Unbelievable. I mean, it's hard for me to believe that he went to the duel, uh, dueling uh, spot without thinking of Onegin, that it might happen to him what happened to Onegin. And it's exactly what happened to him. He died, shot, because of love and jealousy. Yes, you could say, what a fool, what foolishness. Who would uh, risk to, be, to die because of, uh, because of being uh, jealous? But that's passion. Do we have that passion today? I think we are much more cynical and indifferent and cold-blooded. We certainly would not die to, to fight for our honor and to, to, to keep our beloved one just for ourselves. No, no. No, we preserve ourselves. Look at that red 
truck, you know, uh, is it a Volvo probably emerging from the, from the art depot? They do all kinds of interesting things, these Dutch. They really do. They say some, uh, you know, there are echoes also from the, you know, the market uh, in, in Rotterdam. It's almost the upside down market in a certain way. Uh, they also think of solar control glazing, green roof, uh, PV panels, air cooling, good insulation, compact volume, reuse of rainwater, reuse of rainwater, heat and cold storage in the ground, and art, crazy as it is, useless as it is, beautiful as it is, even when it is ugly. the art depot in Rotterdam. Now Bordeaux, located to the east of the river Garonne in Bordeaux, across from the city's UNESCO World Heritage Historic Center, Ilo Query, a courtyard apartment building providing 282 homes, including 128 for social housing. Social housing, meaning these are not expensive uh, things. A uh, parking commercial space and a rooftop restaurant in an intimate urban setting with plenty of light, air, and a large collective green space. Here it is. I regret that it is too white was the exterior. Uh, but you see, in a way, it's kind of the same uh, approach to architecture that we saw in the in the eroded towers in Amsterdam, where towards the outside we had uh, a more or less placid prism, and then it was cut, you know, like we have here, you know, the redness, which means life, and the verity and the fragmentation and the sculpturalness happens more inside, towards the courtyard, than towards the outside. In France, they did this in France, but again, let us not forget 128 apartments or so for, for the underprivileged, social housing. Why should social housing be boring or cheap or banal? It can be also interesting, no? And I think that those people deserve it because they don't have many other joys. So let's at least give them some, some housing that is unique. The Sky Valley, future science and technology city in southwest China. China again. NVRDV has revealed the first images of Chengdu Sky Valley, the firm's competition entry for the future science and technology city in southwest uh, China, fusing technology with nature, urban with rural, and modernity with tradition. The, pro the, propo the proposal introduces a livable city into the Linpan landscape. Located in one of China's emerging cities, the project bala balances the competing needs of the area through a computational workflow developed by in-house tech task force MVRDV Next. It's huge. But hey, it's China. It has to be huge. A former communist country, no? It's just a project. But it's important as a project as well, even if it doesn't get built. They like MDRDV, they like, they like mountains and valleys. I uh, understand. Then T question mark F, what do you think it is? Research, the Y factory, Delft University, the Netherlands. He teaches there. He created this, the Y factory. Let's read it again. The Y factory. 
Interesting naming, no? What does the Y mean? Well, we know what it means. Why? De ce in Romanian? Why? Why? Is the is the is the the question of a child? Green dream. How future cities can outsmart nature? This I don't like. This this wording I do not like. I really don't. And they belong to Willie Mas. And I think he should have known better. Because I don't think it is in the, it, it is the business of future cities or even of, of man to outsmart nature. Because if nature is God, as uh, Frank Lloyd Wright implied and actually said, then how could you outsmart God? But even if you don't believe in God, what is this to outsmart nature? It's known that nature would, all, would always, always outsmart us. I don't think it's, 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 it's a wise statement at all, this so-called green dream of Winnie Mass. You see, Frank Lloyd Wright, study nature, love nature, stay close to nature. It will never fail you. Frank Lloyd Wright would have never said future cities that, that can outsmart nature. Never. Never. He had the highest affection and respect for nature. Love, actually. That's it. And now we go quickly, if you are still with me here, to St. John, to Sfântul Ioan, because it is his, uh, uh, well, for us in the Orthodox uh, uh, tradition, is the St. John's Day, Ziua uh, Sfântului uh, Ioan. And I want to show you a few architectures that were built for St. John, for uh, Sfântul Ioan, as we say in Romanian, for St. John. And there are some great buildings that you are going to see. So quickly, quickly, if you are not tired, we'll, uh, we'll begin now. Building for St. John. Chiesa di San Giovanni Battista in Marsalas. This is an old building uh, and I like it very much. It's not modern, but it doesn't matter. As Charles Baudelaire said, art has two halves. One that speaks about the ephemeral, the transitory, uh, the circumstantial and one that speaks about the eternal and the immutable. And so a very old building could be very present, so to speak, or of the present, because it has that other half, which belongs to the, to the, to the eternal and the immutable. I should have uh, learned more about this building. It might be related to the biography of, of St. John. But it's, 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 it's a fine building in its modesty. St. John the Baptist. La Chiesa di San Giovanni Battista. San Giovanni dei de Lepro, Lebrosi, Lebrosi, Palermo. I like this building too. I like the buildings of MVRDV, but I like this building too. And I like to think that the people who lived at that time, when this building was built, if they saw the buildings by MVRDV, they, they would have liked them. And vice versa, I like to think that MVRDV likes such buildings as this one. When human beings are sensitive, and have a reverence for the mystery of life and for mystery of uh, spirit and for mystery of uh, you know the existential horizons of uh, of, uh, of existence they can do beautiful things in music in literature in plastic arts in architecture but they have to be childlike they have to have that openness, that open mind, that open soul, to, to, to be curious and to ask together with Winnie Mas, why? Why is, the, why is the sky, the blue sky blue? Why are the leaves green? Why is the earth brown? Why does the, the bird fly? Why does the dog bark? Why and why and why? Because there are so many provocations in life and in nature. Chiesa di San Giovanni Battista, Monterosso, Almare, a different church, not uh, inferior to what we already saw. We are going to see 
also some modern examples, some very, very interesting. Why do human beings, why did they give themselves to building churches, buildings, temples, uh, chapels, commemorative uh, parks, and so on? Why? Because spirit ex does exist. The spiritual life does exist. We need it. Yes, there is commerce. Yes, there are hats and toys being sold and postcards in front of churches. But when we go to anywhere in the world, what do we visit? Most often, we visit exactly these, uh, these places of worship. And it is there mainly where the architects show their brilliance. Now, of course, the, the architect as a social worker would love to do architecture that is brilliant also, not just for God, but also for underprivileged people, like those, uh, uh, so that social housing that uh, MVRDB did in France. Chiesa di San Giovanni Battista di, Ma di Matera, where there is a genuine feeling of faith, where there is genuine faith this somehow is shown in the architecture of the building, which doesn't need embellishment. You see, it's just the structure of the building that is uh, emotional enough and inspiring enough. You can imagine these buildings were built with great effort. But why, why did the human beings submit themselves to these great efforts instead of watching TV from the soft... Uh, uh, so far, well, at that time they didn't have uh, TVs and probably didn't have such soft sofa, sofas either. But if I compare our life with their life, our life might be easier. But is it more meaningful? I'm not so sure about it. Watching a worthless uh, Netflix or uh, HBO movie is more important than erecting such buildings? I don't think so. All for St. John, the Baptist. Look at the darkened ceiling and the darkened building. But I think it's beautiful. Église St. Jean Baptiste de Belleville, France. Looks even better in, in the old in the old photograph, doesn't it? All for Saint John, Saint John the Baptist. Now, this might surprise you. Oh, no, not this one. It's the one in Köln. We'll follow. Johannes Kirche in Stuttgart. Here, uh, the, the landscaping is beautiful. Uh, and, uh, you know, in such a landscape, uh, uh, even a lesser building would have, been, would have looked good. But this is not a lesser building. It's, it's a fine building, even though it's flesh. It's not, uh, its spire is not uh, um, built. But uh, it's, it's still a, a, a good building, even in this unclear photograph. Uh, of course, St. John is a very beloved saint. He's not the only one. I particularly, particularly like this view, this picture. Unfortunately, you know, these... Uh, uh, you know, identities displayed all over the picture uh, make me make me nervous, if not angry. But what can we do? Now, Église Saint Jean Baptiste Molenbeek, uh, a more modernistic building, uh, interesting too, a little bit too phallic that tower. But uh, what can we do? You know. We associate sometimes height with spirit, 
and uh, maybe even sometimes uh, masculinity with spirit, which I think is a little bit problematic. But the interior, I think, has some qualities. Rather unexpected, this uh, modernistic interior. But you will see two examples of a more radical design uh, dedicated to St. John very soon. Now, Saint-Jean Saint de Montmartre à Paris, this is a very interesting one, actually, you know, rather unusual, uh, the interior. Again, Saint-Jean de Montmartre. This might be a different uh, Jean, because this Saint-Jean de Montmartre might not be Jean uh, the Baptist. I don't know. I, I'm not uh, I'm not very very knowledgeable about theological matters, but the building intrigues me, and even the outside, rather unusual, is in Paris. Maybe when you go the next time to Paris, you don't forget to 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 search for it. So you see, you can keep the Gothic feeling, but use modern or modernistic forms. The important thing here is the, the feeling, the, the, the content, and the form could, uh, could adapt itself to you know, the time when, when the building is being built. But one thing is for sure, without ornament, most architecture is not architecture. Here, again, it's another proof that ornament is important. Without it, this building would have been poorer. It has structure too, and very convincing, but it also has ornament. And somehow structure becomes ornamental that is pleasing. San Giovanni Battista Church in Florence, this one I showed a few days ago when I presented Giovanni Michelucci, a brilliant Italian architect, and it is a brilliant building uh, outside the Florence, close to the highway, San Giovanni Battista. Here it is. Uh, Michelucci built uh, several churches, but this is the most fa famous and um, it deserves the fame. It's this sacred womb that is animated by the forest of columns, which are tensioned. Uh, they are a little bit, uh, you know, questing and, uh, and, and then anxious even, but um, so this is this is about the truth of the aspiration for God, the truth of the desire for God, and not a dogmatic, frozen and dead, you know, uh, uh, submission to to convention. No, this is about something that is alive, and the building is alive, and uh, as such. It's not, it's not just a soothing building. It's not a soothing building. Look at, the, look at the drawings, the sections, the elevation, the plan. It's not soothing. It's, it's telling the truth that it is a quest, a longing, a desire. Maybe not 
not satisfied or not fully satisfied. It's a cave which wants to become a forest, a forest of concrete columns, not yet very ordered, but they couldn't be too ordered because then they would lie. And he didn't want to lie. Giovanni Michelucci didn't want to lie, as other people do when they erect uh, demagogical cathedrals. And those from Romania know what I'm talking about here in Bucharest. This interior would probably create palpitations and arterial fibrillations in the in the in the servants, so-called servants of God, uh, here who erect that uh, uh, anachronical uh, huge building. But this this building that we look at by 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 Giovanni Michelucci is infinitely superior as architecture compared to what I just mentioned. In, in fact, you cannot compare them. Here we see creativity, originality, and genuine feeling, not mimicking, not applying dogmas, you know, over and over and over again. If the cathedral is the house of God, and if God was and is creative, and if man was and is made in the image and resemblance of God, then because God was and is creative, then man should be creative too. Otherwise, you will insult God. We cannot honor God through dogma, which is static and dead, through rules and regulations. That's not love. I'm sorry. Who'd want a lover who loves, so-called loves, using a book with precepts and rules and regulations? You know, I read here then at point uh, 16, it is said I should do this, and I do this. That's not love. Love is born from the soul, not from a cooking book with instructions. It's a great building even in drawings, and it's a creation, original. And this is an initial sketch by Giovanni Michelucci. Bravo to him. You can see the, the turmoil in his soul when he made this sketch, which is animated by a vision, no? It is a vision. Now this one by Sharon would surprise you a little bit, a great, great German expressionist architect, Johannes Kirche, dedicated to, to, to Johannes, to, to, to St. John, by this very, very important architect, Hans Sharon, doing, building a rather modest building, but very skillfully. Let's look at him, at, at it. Let's look at the building. You know, you might say, what's so special? I think many things are special here. It is not easy to arrive at the poetry of architecture uh, with such uh, austerity and reticence. I mean, look at the skillfulness of playing these uh, stones here, and then you have the water falling from the ceiling exactly here, and it's done very poetically and, and, and very, very skillfully and movingly. And this brick wall in its, uh, you know, uh, infinite uh, changing of tones in different conditions of light and nothing else. It's a simple brick wall, but a brick wall that is built uh, properly is uh, genuine architectural poetry most of the time, if the bricks are not hidden and they should not be hidden. Hans Sharon, who built also the Philharmonia building in Berlin, one of the greatest buildings in Berlin. So this building also in a less dramatic way uh, is, is paying homage to uh, St. John, but not a lesser architect. Hans Sharun was one of the important architects 
of the 20th century. Now, of course, some people might say that these chairs are too mundane and too red and too not suffering, you know, although red could also mean suffering, you know, blood. But, uh, and maybe that's why they, even, they were even made like this. Um, Again, this is not an architecture born from dogma. This is an architecture born from the soul and the imagination of the architect, as it should be. And look at the plan. Very nice. It's hard to it's hard not to love architecture when you look at such works. I mean, even here, you know, where you say nothing special here is, well, it's a you know, the, it's outside of the church per se. It's inside the building, but it's like it's it's like a you know uh, an intermediate space in a way, like a piedestal for a sculpture. It doesn't have to compete with the church, so it's more reticent. It's fine. But then we have uh, other things happening here, you know, and uh, uh, the plan itself has a certain movement and a certain drama that is noticeable. I imagine, I didn't visit the building, but I imagine when you are inside, you, per you perceive these uh, walls, which are not perfectly parallel, these approximations, you know, these hesitations. And here we see some drawings of Hans Sharun. L'Eglise Jean d'Arc Rouen, another great building and dedicated to the greatest of all. I have the highest admiration for Jean d'Arc, Joanna of Arc. And if there are five great movies in the world, and there are more than five, but one of those five for me is Joanna of Arc by the great Danish film director, Carl. Theodor Dreyer, who made, I think, in the 1930s or 1920s, an unbelievable movie called Joanna Vark, Joanna Dark. And this is this is a good good building dedicated to this to this saint. The church killed a saint, burned to death, burned to stake or at stake, I even forgot how it is said correctly, a 19 years old girl who was a saint. This is what the church does. This is the building in Rouen for Jeanne d'Arc, Joanna of Arc. Look at it, builders of the banal cathedrala so-called Mântuirii Neamului. Look at this building and become ashamed of your dogmas. Now, uh, why do we allow hypocrisy to win so many wars? Why? And demagogy, falseness in other words. Why can't we tell the truth? It's a good building, this one. Try to watch that film by Carl Dreyer. You will not regret. It's in black and white and it's mute. It was even lost for a number of years. It was found uh, accidentally many years later. An unbelievable film. And in the film, there is also an actor who plays, uh, who was a great uh, theater man, uh, 
men of theater, Antonin Artaud, a genius in theater. He plays in the movie. The movie is, again, one of the best movies I ever saw and I will ever see. Don't watch H HBO movies. Don't watch Netflix movies. They are worthless. They are commercial enterprises. That's not art. Art is somewhere else. Now you look here, the building of the, you know, the building of the buildings of the city. And then you see the building dedicated to, to, to Joanna Bark. And you see here, the architecture is conveying the drama of the life of Joanna Bark. I almost say, I almost said of the Saint Joanna Bark. Because in the movie, at one moment, someone erupts in telling the truth and accusing the church of killing a saint. And that's exactly what they did. They killed a saint. And she's a symbol of France now. At 17, at 17, she was in front leading the army, the French armies against the English armies and won the battle. And at 19, she died, burned to stake by a hypocritical and, 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 and criminal church. Very sad. And the crimes continue in the name of lies and hypocrisy. Rouen, France. Finally, truth won. All those churchmen who preserved themselves and burned Joanna of Arc are gone. Nobody remembers them. But Joanna of Arc, look, she's here. Now, this one is one of the most intriguing and provocative church buildings that I ever saw. I didn't see it in so-called reality, but I, I was happy to discover it uh, on the web. Johannes the 23rd. I don't know who Johannes the 23rd was or is, but Johannes, we know what it means. It means John. It means Jon. It means Jean. Kirche. Church. Köln. Germany, look at this. I like it. Uh, people, some people call it brutalist, whatever they want to call it. I like it. It's it's vigorous. It's fresh. It's 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 telling the truth about the drama of life. And uh, if we don't do it through a church, then I don't know through what. And, uh, you know, uh, often the, the important church figures, I'm not talking about the little, you know, uh, hypocritical uh, uh, so-called servants and go of God. I am, I'm talking about those who sacrificed and sacrificed their lives for truth. And if a church is to tell the truth about life and about faith, I think it should have some drama. Although, as you know, I liked even the first building I showed, which was very, well, very old, but and, and rather, you know, quiet and, and almost serene. It depends. But we live in, in, we live in modern times, and this building is, uh, is telling us uh, perhaps, plus it was built after the Second World War. I mean, how much serenity could one have after the Second World War? Call it brutalist if you want, but I think the feeling behind it was not brutal, was actually very sensitive uh, and maybe connected with, uh, with, with suffering. And even if, you, even if you didn't know it was a church, and it is a church, you know, passing by, you probably would have thought this, is, this might be a church, an unusual church, but it might be a church. What else could it be? And it is a church. And look at the interior. I think it's very good. I'm not so sure about the two colors, you know, I mean, 
blue and red, but uh, who knows? It depends also on the conditions of light, I guess. Probably in the sunset is much better. Um, Köln, Germany, or Cologne. In black and white is good too. St. John Abbey's Church, Marcel Breuer. Now we, we go to a famous architect, Marcel Breuer, uh, and uh, St. John's Abbey Church uh, in the United States. Another good building, uh, again done in concrete, and Marcel Breuer was considered a brutalist architect. He was uh, first a student and then an instructor at the Bauhaus, then he crossed the ocean together with Walter Gropius. They collaborated. Mar Marcel Breuer was a was a you know uh, a partner for for Walter Gropius, and then he started his own activity. He built many important, inter inter interesting, and engaging buildings. This is one of them. Born in Hungary, actually, Marcel Breuer. And he, as a young man, I think he was 18, he went to Germany, uh, to Weimar, to enter Bauhaus. He did, and then the sky was the limit. Why? Because he was creative, and because he studied in a very creative school. A very creative school, which unfortunately in the later years, out of the 13, 14 years of its existence, forgot a little bit its beginnings, which were almost mystical. If we consider that such great artists like Vasily Kandinsky or Paul Klee or Johannes Eaton Tode and Oskar Schlemmer and the others, Lionel Feininger, it was, a, it was a beautiful moment in education and in art, the Bauhaus. And the last word of the manifesto written by Walter Gropius in 1919 for the Bauhaus was faith. Yes, faith. And he uses the, uses the word heavens twice in a very short manifesto. That's why I said that the beginnings, the Bauhaus was rather uh, almost a mystical school. And the graphic representation of the manifesto was what they called the Cathedral of Socialism, uh, a woodcut, uh, an engraving done by Lionel Feininger. But look at this interior of this uh, church by, the, by uh, Marcel Breuer. Look at the heaviness of the, and the drama of the ceiling, you know, which is pressing you down, maybe to make you humble, to, 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 to have the necessary humbleness in front of God. So Marcel Breuer was a non-Christian building for the Christian community. He was a Jew, just like Santiago Calatrava, who designed and won the competition for the completion or the, the growth, the development of uh, Saint John the Divine, Saint John the Divine Cathedral in New York City. It doesn't matter. You don't have to belong necessarily to the. Uh, religious denomination you are working for, you know, because what matters is the quality of your uh, engagement with the truth of the building and the adequate expression of what you want to say, instead of mimicking religiosity, you know, ad literam or, or dogmatically.
But in such cases, it's not just the architect to be admired, but also the, you know, the so-called clients, those who commissioned the work and trusted the architect. They deserve applauses or, or recognition too, because a building doesn't come into being just because of the architect. There are many forces that, that come together in order to make a good building and unfortunately a bad building come into being. Marcel Breuer in the United States. Modern stained glass windows, why not? Now, Chiesa di San Giovanni Battista by Mario Botta, another interesting building. Uh, Mario Botta used to do some good architecture at the beginning, then did some problematic buildings, but this building I like, Chiesa di San Giovanni, uh, yeah, using stone. Um, So how is it called exactly? Chiesa di San Giovanni Battista, Monio, Monio, um, probably in the Italian part of uh, Switzerland, from where Mario Botta is uh, actually is. A little bit, uh, a little bit forced, I would say, the design, but it has qualities. It has some qualities, but a little bit too deterministic for my taste, but it still has variety and it has some qualities, especially when he plays with concavity and convexity. Uh, he sometimes uh, achieves uh, good results. As you can see, St. John, Johannes, Jean inspired many architects. Now, you, what do we look at here? Harmony through contrast. The building by Mario Botta has nothing in common with the buildings around. It's okay. It's even better. After all, is the house of God there, no? But through St. John. But it's still the house of God, of spirit, of sacrality. It cannot look like the others, although sometimes it could. It depends. What's important is the genuineness of, of, of the engagement with making the building with us, its spirit. Architecture deserves its name only when it is creative, only then. Otherwise, it is not architecture. And we should actually not use the word if it's not creative. It has to be creative. Now, I don't know if he was the one who drew the Le Corbusier silhouette there, as you can see. I hope he was not him. It was not him because <laughs> I don't think it's necessary, you know, for a, for a, for a good building to use uh, the paradigmatic little man by Le Corbusier. You don't need it. And the manner of uh, graphic design uh, that Mario Botta uses is very different from what Le Corbusier used, as you can see here. Now, it's very possible that the drawing was not done by in, in the office of Mario Botta. But these are his own drawings, Mario Botta's drawings, studies for the section and so on. There is drama, yes, but of course it has to be drama. No, I mean, if we are to contemplate the, the, the life of uh, St. John, and in general, no, the life of, 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 of sacrifice, the reality of sacrifice of, 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 of great religions, in general, there was suffering, there was sacrifice. That's why we cannot honor genuinely and we cannot otherwise we cannot honor spirit through lies and dogmas we can't it has to be felt not learned by points 
and by instructions, but felt Interesting sight, no? The old buildings on the right and the new building on the left with plenty of people in between and the magnificent mountains. And I think I, I end with this, if I'm not mistaken, some ruins for St. John, for St. John. Uh, you know, an invitation to contemplate the evolution and the involution of life. We are all born in order to die, and the buildings are born in order to die, and nature takes over whatever Winnie Mass might, might think that, uh, you know, the future cities will over outsmart nature. This will never happen. We cannot outsmart nature. And it's actually a good thing that we cannot outsmart nature. So in this case, we see a cohabitation between, you know, the world of man and the green of nature or God. And it's still a transitory period, so to speak. But we see clearly that nature is uh, is coming back. But it's coming back, I think, with some affection for the bricks of the former church. Because I think the green of the leaves understands that the bricks were made of earth, and the bricks understand that the leaves of the trees and the bushes and the ivy and so on belong to the earth just as they belong to the earth. The bricks. I love ruins, it's true. This once once was a church dedicated to Saint Saint John, and still is in spirit. And not just in spirit. These ruins are loving and lovable. And they deserve our sympathy. Because these ruins are ourselves, actually. A great picture with these three who took over the building in a magnificent way. Thank you.